Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. There's great competition today, so um, I'm delighted you're all here because, frankly, the food here is really worth eating, and this is a talk about food culture. My name is Kitty Boone. I work for the Aspen Institute. I collaborate with Atlantic on other programs, including Aspen Ideas Festival, and in another month, we'll be working with them here in Washington on a program with Bloomberg called City Lab. And we have a long-standing relationship, and it's just really great to be part of the Atlantic Festival. Um, we are going to take a break from the heavy issues of the day, which are only getting heavier as Washington moves th through this day, and talk about the fun sort of food culture that's evolving in Washington. I lived here some time ago, and it's a very different place in that respect. Um, so it's going to be fun to talk about this. It wasn't that long ago that Washington was kind of a food desert. Um, but then a few years ago, Bon Appetit magazine named Washington the tw in 2016 the top food city in the country, which is great. So there's a lot of really interesting things going on and um, a lot of interesting chefs, name chefs, et cetera, and so forth. I um, want you to all turn off your cell phones so we don't have reverberations in the room, and I will welcome our colleagues who are very cool. I just spent some time talking with them. Peter Prime, um, chef at Kane. Christian Iarbian, chef and owner of Amparo Fandita. Amparo is named for his mother, which I love. And Putrice Cunningham, general manager and executive chef of Gogi Yogi. Goji Yogi? Gogi Yogi. Gogi Yogi. <laughs> And um, my friend and colleague, uh, Corby Cummer, who has straddled between writing for The Atlantic for years and now running a food and society program, as well as our own magazine, at um, the Aspen Institute, where The Atlantic talks about culture and food. Corby's very invested at the Aspen Institute in trying to bring people around food health policy, et cetera. So it's a wonderful mix that he brings to the stage. I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Corby, thank and thank you, you for coming. Kitty. Kitty is the master of all she surveys, so it is very thrilling to have Kitty in the room. So thanks very much. So we have a, a picture of the changing food scene in Washington and what new leadership looks like. And I'm thrilled that The Atlantic brought us together in this room today, and we had a chance to exchange a bit about personal and family histories, and we're going to bring it forward right now. Um, so. So the idea of purity of influence, you're all serving food that has different regional influences and influences from your family. Uh, Trinity, Latin America, Korea in general. How important is that in what you're making now? And was it anything of a struggle or a challenge to be able to bring it forward on a menu and have diners accept it? Um, so it's, it's been a progression for me, but this, uh, this current restaurant, this is, this is the food that I grew up eating. This is absolutely what, um, some of my favorite meals from my mom, some of, uh, some of my favorite food. It is, uh, a pretty, uh, well, accurate, um, representation of what I, I grew up eating and loving. It's there. It's everyone can go into um, Kane and get fantastic rum drinks. Yes, um, um, doubles. You can have great oxtails. Uh, we have a lot of lot of delicious curries, uh, paratha, and um, it speaks to the uh, the African and the Indian influences. And we kind of visit some of the other uh, Caribbean islands. We have a pepper pot from Guyana, and uh, jerk from Jamaica, and. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can you can have some of the some really authentic Caribbean food um, and some of the stuff that has traveled up and down the Caribbean, and we all enjoy. And my colleague and friend Ann Limpert at Washingtonian, where I was food critic for a while, um, said that they headlined something on the website: "Our food critic can't stop eating the food." At, at Kate. So you can all have that experience uh, for yourselves. Christian, the food you serve, and, and also make us hungry by describing a little of it. Well, uh, for me, it was cooking in a lot of French and Italian restaurants, fine dining, growing up, um, and then realizing that I'd never seen the food that I grew up eating served and presented in that way. 
and trying to figure out how to do that. Um, also, as I grew older, I, gr I grew mo more nostalgic of the food I grew up with. So it was a constant um, internal dialogue of how I could bring that food that was mostly home cooked meals and put them on a plate and present them the same way that, you know, I was seeing this, you know, French and Italian food. Um, <coughs> so we, we all have, you were up in Mexico till the age of 11, then El Paso, and I'm sure in a very strongly Mexican, Mexican influenced community. So you were around this food always. We go to a lot of Mexican restaurants and we think we have an idea about Mexican food. How is it wrong? Well, I think the United States, well, I think probably most of the world has a, a very quick way of pigeonholing something, pigeonholing a culture into five digestible things that you can always get no matter where you go. Um, and we were talking, you know, uh, about uh, the influences in the islands. Um, in Mexico, it's sort of the same thing. The communities and um, the influences other than the indigenous um, food that exists there has been formed and things that are now known as Mexican food are very much influenced by the Middle East, by Italy, by France, um, Spain, ev everyone that sort of walked through Mexico um, to where it is now. So, And give us a taste of some of the dishes you'll be putting on the menu in the restaurant you're, you're in the process of opening. Um, very much my grandparents cooking, um, restaurants that they had when I was younger, uh, very, mom and pop shops in strip malls in Texas and in Mexico, um, slightly more refined. But um, I think one of our more sought out dishes is a pasta dish. We do a ravioli stuffed with fresh recason and weed la coche, that's uh, roasted poblano sauce and wild mushrooms. And when people come in, that's the last thing they expect on the menu is a, is a, pasta, a pasta course. It's pretty great. But it will be the first thing we order. So <laughs> write it down. Patrice. Hey, hello. Um, so growing up, my mom cooked all the time. Um, and it was always a blend of traditional Korean food and also American food. And it was just something that I always just remembered and just loved so much. And so as I kind of got older um, and kind of dove into this culinary field, I've always wanted to just explore Korean food, even like just on my own. One, to just kind of retain the culture for myself so I can kind of pass it on to my children, um, but also to kind of share it with other people. Because growing up, um, all my friends love when I cooked, when my mom cooked. And um, I guess at this point, I've just been wanting to kind of share that passion with a lot of other people and to DC where I'm from. Um, and so I'm just really excited to be with Gogi Yogi and being able to share a specific part of Korean culture and food, Korean barbecue um, specifically, that's just so much fun, interactive, something that like I always look forward to when my mom would come back from the Korean market and she would have lettuce and the pork belly and you know, um, the garlic and the Korean peppers, and I just knew what time it was. It was like Korean barbecue time, <laughs> you know? And so all the banchans and the soups and um, just like, just all the different types of foods that right now I'm just really excited to kind of put on a menu, share it with you guys in DC. So it's been, it's been great. And did you have to, because my next question is <laughs> how front and center do you want your family's experience to be on the menu and how much do you want your family's experience to register with diners i ask because uh chef kwame owachi um who now has kith and kin but he had a restaurant in shaw where every course was preceded by a description of how it was influenced by his family and his life and, and where he was when he first tasted something like that. Um, it was absolutely front and center of the dining experience. And you've described such very strong family influence. How important is it for you that it register with the diners? And also, 
um, I want more of a taste of what this food is. <laughs> and did you have to go back to your mother and say, okay, it was always Korean barbecue time, but how do you make that? Or had you just absorbed it? Yeah, I mean, you just absorb it. And then I kind of, in order for me, well, to have developed the menu now, I had to really rely on her to kind of refine some of the ingredients and recipes. And I'm like, I know how you make that, but I just, I know it's missing something. And so we would talk on the phone a lot, and she would say, you got to do this first and then do that next. And I'm like, okay, got it. And only because she was your mother, <laughs> she didn't leave out the most important ingredient. Right. <laughs> exactly. And um, I don't, she's just been great throughout this whole process. Um, she'll even come to the restaurant now and, like, you know, help me put the kimchi together. And um, she'll talk to some of uh, the kitchen crew and say, no, don't do it like that. Save that. Don't waste that. So it's been really great having her there, like, right by my side, um, kind of just being that mentor that she's always been. So. But does she appear in the restaurant? Do the servers, do you ask the servers to make sure that when we're ordering something, we know it's the way your family ate it? Yeah, um, actually, what's interesting is because I'm actually front of house as well, the general manager as well, yeah, I'm mostly on the floor. So what I get, what's really great about that is I get direct feedback from the guests um, on my food. No one knows that I actually, you know, kind of did the menu and, and, and all that. So I just kind of keep that low profile. But Why but, so <laughs> modest? I mean, I just want to know. I just want to know how they feel. And, you know, mo majority of the time, it's what I want them to feel. They're just... And it's great. It's such a great feeling. I don't want to interrupt so that at all. So then you like strip off your beautiful clothes and there's a white <laughs> uniform underneath and you say, well, I just came in from the kitchen and it's spotted. No, 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 no. I just, if, it, if, it, if a server mentions it to a guest or if they recognize me from a recent article or something like that, I'll just, you know, have a brief conversation and keep it moving and we'll and I walk them through how to eat the Korean barbecue the way I like to eat it and it's surprising because a lot of people eat it like not the way I eat it and so, <laughs> so is the problem forks and knives no, what is the problem I, I think and this is what I encourage the staff I'm like you got to explain the lettuce wraps so you got to explain how to you know, make it a bite size, um, you know, kind of one bite scenario. And you got to suggest, like, you know, the different banchans to put in it. And, you know, you have to tell them to put that sauce in it. So for me, when I'm touching tables, I like to go around and kind of walk people through that experience. So that's really fun. Gosh, now we even want to go more. <laughs> Christian. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're still discussing like family like influence, family influences how right? much it's going to be prominent people will know this is what you grew up having yeah. or not well yeah i mean it's it's such a strong feeling that i it, the first i think the first like 6 7 years of cooking i was constantly trying to strive for you know how many ingredients could i put on a plate or you know what's the craziest thing i could i could bring about um, and Again, as I've, as I've gotten older and I keep missing those flavors, um, now it's just like a constant thought of like, why, why, haven't, why, why don't I cook this more, right? Um, and more to the point of just like knowing, knowing what time it is, you know, and you, you, you smell those smells and being able to be in the kitchen now. Um, and as we're pre preparing all the food and we're toasting chiles and we're, you know, we're grinding masa and we're making salsas and all of these things, the, the first thing that I think about when I walk into the kitchen, it's, it's Sunday afternoon at my grandparents' house, which is when everybody came over and you know, the whole family was there, the neighbors came over, the friends came over, and it was just this, it was Sunday. Like, that's what Sundays were about. Are you, well, first of all, of course we all want to go to your grandparents on Sunday. So it is fantastic that we're going to have that opportunity. But is there going to be any way you're trying to telegraph that to the diner? Um, well, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the menu is built around the sense of community, which is something that I feel I lost when, when we moved to the States, definitely after we left Texas and uh, migrated upwards to DC. Um, the menu is, you know, we're pulling away from tacos. That's sort of like the big, the big thing right now. It's like we're not serving tacos, 
we're serving braces, we're serving tortillas, we're saving all, all the accoutrements. It's like, make your own taco. My, my grandmother and my mother never built my tacos for me. They just slopped a tower of tortillas and gave me a plate of hot food, and then it was up to you. You could make it a taco, you could dip your tortilla in it, you could break it, you could, you could do whatever you wanted with it. You said you're grinding masa, so it's not yeah. going to be flour, or is there going to be a flour option, or is it going to be all masa um, tortillas? Well, yes, so we're, we're grinding corn to make the, the masa, um, but I did, I have very deep southwestern roots, um, so flour tortillas mostly around brunch and breakfast, mm -hmm. um, but they do make a, a strong appearance in the restaurant. <laughs> okay, strong appearance. Caribbean, Trinidad, family. Um, so like I was saying before, you know, this is the stuff that my mom served. Uh, you know, when I'm in the dining room, or, um, you know, it's something, if we're talking about it, something that comes up. And uh, do you go into the dining room a lot? Uh, yeah, a fair bit, a fair bit more than I'm used to. Uh, I, uh, and, the, and all of our servers kind of discuss the history of the individual dishes, especially for with the new guests, you know. So, you know, they, we typically eat the pepper pot at Christmas, and um, you know, it's just something that we're doing year round now. Um, tell them how we eat uh, the parathas and the curries, and you know, it's it's just very interactive. Um, so it's on, you know, it's usually the server interacting with the with the guest, and then people who know the food, they know it's typically home food. Well, how many people who come in do know the food? Um, so, you know, it's, we have a really interesting uh, mix of guests. We have a lot of uh, Caribbean expats who are coming and looking for a, a sit-down restaurant where they can, uh, you know, taste the flavors of home. And then, you know, DC has this. We're in a great neighborhood, so we have a lot of neighbors uh, coming and visiting. And then DC has this cool foodie culture, and, um, you know, people are coming and checking out uh, what we're doing. And how many tables? In fact, I'd like to go down. Seats, really tiny, 33 seats. Yeah, that was one of the things the Washington, she couldn't stop eating the food once she got a table. And, um, and she, it, evidently the food comes quickly, um, so, so it comes fast, but lines. Yeah. No reservations. Seats don't come quickly. Lines. So what is your recommendation for what time we get there? Um, earlier, later, you know. Uh, what does so earlier mean? Five when we open, uh, later, closer to close, a lot of, uh, we have a wait list that starts, and um, you know, you can get on the wait list uh, online, and people drop off at the end, so late, if you're a late night kind of diner, you How late get does a, late mean? Um, 10 on the weekends, so we close at 11, but if you come in like around What about 10, weeknights? Weeknights, we close at 10. We're leaving you with practical tips on this panel. Yeah, yeah. So you're definitely Tuesdays going to... are great, coming on Tuesdays. Uh. <laughs> and, and Christian, tell us how many seats there are going to be and, and if you have any projected timeline for when the restaurant's going to open. Fall 2019, question mark. But that's like right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, this is fall 2019, if I, I hate to remind you. Yeah, we, we're, we're projecting about 55 seats on the inside. Um, hopefully, once permits come in, we'll get another 20 outside. Um, the timeline is very dependent on fundraising. Um, My next question. Oh, there so you glad go. that you brought it up. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're we're sort of we're we're trucking along at the at the pace that we can you know clear checks and insert coin to move on to the next level through the construction process. That is a great way of putting it. Insert yeah. coin, move to next level of construction <laughs> yeah. process. So, Patrice, I want to start with you because I was asking, I'm very interested in how the transition and path can move from working in the front of the house or being a chef to an ownership position. Um, because I, I find in my reporting and my observation, I was for three years the restaurant critic of Atlanta magazine. So. I would see all kinds of people of color rise to GM. So they would be the managers or they would be servers. One executive chef in my entire three years, entire three years of reviewing. But the question is why, why aren't there more owners who are people of color? And Patrice took the time, effort, and money to get a business degree. She has an MBA. And when I asked her so, you know, do you have this clear vision of being a restaurant owner, she said? Not really. I mean, kind of throughout the experience of working front of house and being in that kind of higher management position, I've had to work really closely with owners, um, both 
kind of on the corporate side and also on the independent side. So it's rough. Um, it's not um, something, well, I think it's really awesome to own your own business, which is why I pursued an MBA, um, and which is uh, you know an immediate goal for me. But um, recently, I don't know if owning a restaurant is exactly what I want anymore. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, I think the business is a challenge. I think it has very like special parts of it that I love to operate and to manage and to build and to grow. Um, but I think uh, right now I'm not sure if that's the immediate goal. Um, I think maybe later down the road, um, and I, let me backtrack. I think the most, I think one of the biggest obstacles is financial. I think it's hard to find the money to invest in your own self. And so then you have to be in a role where you're looking for investors or, you know, capital. And that whole world also has its challenges. So um, right now, I think my immediate goals is to, you know, continue to build, you know, a brand and a company that, um, for me, is something more realistic, um, something that I feel like I can, you know, realistically do right now financially. Um, and so, um, right now, I don't think owning a restaurant is kind of where I'm at. So, Christian, now that Patrice has um, painted this very appealing picture of complete control and ownership of a brand or company that you can do on your own time and figuring out a, a controlled business model instead of the chaotic world of restaurants, are you having second thoughts? And, uh, and what was it like for you to go and try to raise money? Well, I'll start with the first question. And I guess everybody wants a unicorn. Right until they get one, and then then you got to walk it, you got to feed it, you got to put it to sleep. Um, so it's not it's not that I'm having second thoughts, but it's it's I think it's very much like every every level accomplished in my entire career where I was a line cook and I really wanted to be a sous chef, and then I got the sous chef job and I was like crap, okay, and then I really wanted that executive chef job and then I got it and I was like oh crap. <laughs> and now I really wanted to own my own place. And then I started the process and we're, we're about a year in and it's just, oh crap, but more often. <laughs> um, and then as far as, as, far as um, raising money, it's, I mean, it's definitely uh, an interesting process. Uh, the first thing that people ask me every time that we're talking about fundraising is like, did you do a friends and family round? And my first answer to that is, I send money to my family in Mexico. So there, you know, there's this cultural, um, I guess, misunderstanding um, as to where I, I have friends that were born and raised in the States, and they have uh, family and friends that were able to sort of pitch in and say, here's, a, here's, a, here's 50K, here's 20K, go, go try to do something with it. Um, and for us, it's sort of been like, we got to figure out where to get that 20K from mm -hmm. um, while still, you know, making sure that family back home is getting cash and the whole, the whole ecosystem of the family is still, still thriving, right? Um, the, I guess the connections or the networks aren't as intertwined here. Um, even my family that does live in the States up until now, I mean, my mom is, I'm not trying to, put a number on it, but she's, she's, she's in her late 60s, and she still works two jobs, you know, and that's sort of been um, since we got here. I mean, I, when she was younger and I was younger, I mean, I think there was points where she worked three jobs, uh -huh. um, just to trying, to, trying to keep it together. Um, I think now she just sort of, like, got used to working that much, so she refuses to work less. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge um, being able to go into places and say, hey, we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to raise money for this business. Um, first of all, restaurants don't have a big, a big stigma of being like a sure, an assured investment. Mm -hmm. So that makes it hard off the bat. Um, two, uh, the other thing is we get a lot of people saying, hey, we got money for you, but as soon as you hit this number. so. 
you know, we'll give you money when you have money. So it's just... I think anyone who's raised money is familiar with that <laughs> response. And family and friends, was that... Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I opened the restaurant with my sister. Um, I was lucky, um, you know, through my experiences. And the, the last venue I was, I, the last restaurant that I worked at, it was a really huge space. So when they offered the direction, something small that we could open together. And um, yeah, so I, I was fortunate I was able to do that. And, and tell us something about the restaurants you worked in before, but also finish that thought. Yeah, and you know, and, and but it's taken a lot longer to get here as well. You know, I would, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a bit older than these guys, and you know, it took a while to get to the point where we could, you know, we could do this together. But um, yeah. Um, and is she a silent partner, or is she greeting everybody and saying, "Eat my brother's know, food. It's what we grew up with." You know, she's she she she's doing that. She still works her regular job, but she she's uh, she's there. On a regular basis, she was uh, behind the design and uh, the look of the of the restaurant, and yeah, she's a big part. Um, but what about the big spaces you'd worked in? Because the next thing I'd like to hear about is the culture of the kitchens and the front of the house, but especially the kitchens that you want to build since you now are in charge, and how that's different from what you'd experienced at previous jobs. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a uh, that's a uh, that's a huge thing. Um, you mentioned Chef Kwame's book, um, or you mentioned Chef Kwame, something he was talking about in his book. Um, the last bit, I, what I was talking about before, the last restaurant that I worked at, it was just a huge space. I was the executive chef, so um, the culture was, was similar, but I, I was talking in terms of uh, space and, and cost. Um, in terms of kitchen culture, some of the places, uh, you know, what you see in fine dining, um, just just a lot of just in restaurant culture in general, it's you know it's go go go, seven days a week, um, no work life balance. Mm -hmm. Depending on the chef, uh, depending on the culture of the individual restaurant, you know, it can be it can be fairly abusive in the kitchen. You know that's part of uh, the way you come up, and for a long time has been pretty consistent throughout the industry. Um, it's great to see that changing and people coming and uh, bringing passion, cooking with love, um, and that's what we try to do. You know, it's like I want people to, all the chefs who work for me, they can, they can do, they can always add their their own elements to the food. You know, it's you have to understand the concept, but um, so one of my chefs, he actually makes curry beef better than I do now, Ooh. and he um, he actually started putting a little papalao in it, and um, Something that I've, and I've never had before, but it's amazing. It wakes it up, and um, I mean, I, I think his is better than mine now. Um, <laughs> and um, I think that that is well. What I want to do is, you know, harness the people who work with me, who have passion about food, and then sort of express what I'm trying to do at this specific concept. And you know, that way everybody's invested. It's their food. It's our food. Everybody wants it to go out right. Everybody wants it to look good. And you know that you know. Other than that, I have to, you know, I have to be behind everyone pushing. I, I want it to be an organic kind of thing that we're creating together. I think Katie would agree at the Aspen Institute. We would call that leadership. So that sounds like very effective leadership. Christian, what are you aiming to build in comparison? Because you've had big restaurant jobs. Well, I think he spoke to a lot of it. Um, I think growing up, growing up in kitchens. Um, specifically French kitchens, as I did when I was younger. It's the, the best word I guess I could always use to describe it is violent. Not necessarily physically, but de definitely verbally, emotionally, spiritually, morally, any, any kind of other, other uh, descriptor you can use for it. And you um, left a good job to sign up for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, he had, a, yeah. he had a nine to five job at the World Bank for seven years. Oh. Yeah. And then one day decided, no, I would like a life of emotional violence and abuse. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't getting hit enough, so. Um, yeah, and so with that, with, I mean, with that, you know, it came that, you know, it, it helps you get thicker skin. It, get, it helps you develop, you know, precision and speed and making sure that you're 
pay attention to every, every detail, but it definitely always comes at a cost of work-life balance, emotional distress, development of you know, dependency on different substances. Um, your demeanor becomes immediately defensive to anything and everything because you don't know who's coming mm -hmm. and what, what their intention is. Um, you mean fellow employees? Oh yeah, and supervisors and yeah, every, everyone. Every, everyone eventually becomes a monster. <laughs> and mostly because you're, you're either tired or, you know, I mean, we used to work shifts where we had to be in the kitchen at 7 a.m., do all of our prep, made sure we were ready for lunch, do lunch service while we were prepping for dinner, get ready for dinner, set up, welcome service, do two turns, and then finish cleaning the kitchen. By that point, it was midnight, and then get together, have a meeting, talk about what tomorrow was gonna look like. You're leaving the kitchen around 1.32 in the morning. Mm -hmm. You're getting five hours of sleep, and then you gotta crush service again the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Um, your, your one or two days off you get off are mostly spent sleeping. Yeah. So li very, life, it, life gets put on pause, I it's think. It's a very appealing but, picture you're painting. <laughs> We can understand why you went for it. Um, but no, tell us what you want to build. And how are you going to be able to get your numbers to work if you're humane? There you go. Um, well, I think as, as kitchens have been moving, I think a lot of it, a lot of the, the desire to execute at those levels um, has waned off on me. I don't know that I necessarily want to be, you know, cooking a process that takes four days to make a dish, unless it's mole, that's the only thing. Uh -huh. um, but Certain things are sacred. Yeah. Um, the, the, the culture that, we, that we've been working on is figuring out how to organize ourselves better, how to not walk into a complete fire every single day, how to you know, make sure that we have consistency in production, consistency in skill set, and all of that I think comes with staff retention, how to, how to train and motivate and keep people happy so that they don't leave. Um, I think a lot of these places that I worked at before, the struggles of the chefs and the management staff came from lack of organization and people leaving. So you're constantly training somebody, you're constantly playing catch up because of that. And it's energy, it's money, it's a lot of things. So, so just figuring out ways to cross-train, keep people motivated, keep people educated and hungry for learning more. And Patrice, you were kind of building from, thank you, you were kind of building from scratch because you were very experienced in the front of the house, managed uh, fancy restaurants, but then decided, I want to cook, and uh, became a chef. But certainly in your years, you had been a very close observer of the kitchen culture and so what is it that you wanted to build and and where did your vision turn into some realities that you couldn't change if if so yeah so um i've definitely been abused by chefs <laughs> verbally um and you know i've always i never understood it um i was just kind of like what is what is that what is that ego driving all of that anger and but how lucky that you didn't personalize it and yeah. you were able to say that's that person's problem yeah and um going through this journey i just always remind myself it one it's not in my nature to be like that and secondly um i don't think it's positive or it it doesn't encourage it doesn't motivate like we've kind of all hit on and um kind of throughout my experience in the front of house coaching um you know, making people feel like they're a part of something. Um, I kind of translated all of my front of house experience to the back of house um, and never really considered taking the mean chef approach or anything like that. I just don't think it's effective. I don't think it's, um, I don't think it works. Um, a lot of people invoke fear in order to kind of get something you know, done, but um, there's so many other ways to accomplish um, and meet your goals in, in a more respectful and humane way, like you said. And I think overall, um, with my kitchen staff, you know, we, it's a family at this point, and you know, we're going through the trenches together, um, we're making mistakes together, um, we're learning from each other, and especially as a new chef, I'm still learning too, and you know, they've, some of them have more experience in the kitchen than I do at this point. So 
Or um, make beef curry better. <laughs> exactly. So um, it's a two-way street for me. And so, yes, um, there's definitely things that I feel like I can offer. Um, but I'm also there and open to hearing their suggestions and the things that they think would work better. And, you know, sometimes they're right. I'm like, yeah, that is actually more efficient. Uh, let's go that route. So, yeah. Great. So you're open to ideas. The last question, because you, you now, this is the um, work part for you. You have to think of questions because <laughs> we're going to go to um, questions right after this one, which is um, activism and public profile and issues of social justice. I bring it up because chefs have taken the lead a lot in trying to talk about what, what kitchen culture is like and, and how it should change. And they've been influential in kind of opening up the doors and saying, in the case of Renee Redzepi in Copenhagen at Noma, I was wrong, I've lost my temper, I've been abusive. It's what I grew up with in the sense of the way he was trained in kitchens. and. I can't keep doing that anymore. It's not working for my staff, and I want to influence the way chefs behave. Um, but it's more than that. I don't think there's a figure more admirable in the food world or pretty much in public life today than Jose Andres. And Christian has had a direct experience watching and working with Christian. So I'm going to start with Christian because I know from what I read about you that that's been an important part of your professional identity. Is it a luxury to make it part of your professional identity, or can it become something that you really can incorporate into being um, an, an effective chef while running a business? Um, well, the, the, hope, the hopes and dreams is that, yes, you can, you can correlate both of them and integrate them in a way that is both helpful and uh, hits the numbers every, every day. Um, Definitely working with Jose was, was a huge inspiration originally when World Central Kitchen was just beginning. Um, the end of last year, I got a chance to spend a long time that felt almost eternal because of the amount of work we had to do um, in Tijuana when uh, the big migrant caravans were coming in. Uh -huh. um, and then from that, and before that and through it, through it all, um, you know, I've worked with different organizations like D Central Kitchen doing a lot of volunteer work. Um, and there's a, another program similar to DC Central Kitchen focused on helping Latin American immigrant women um, based out of Arlington called La Cocina. And out of that has been born this need to, you know, bring that into the kitchen. Um, we're, we're constantly talking about um, how dry the talent pool is, how hard it is to staff restaurants. Um, so part of the program that we're trying to develop is, you know, not just making food, but also how do we make people, how do we make chefs, how do we make cooks, and bring people in that haven't necessarily had these chances. You know, we're talking about fundraising in, in, a, in a land or a place that isn't your own. How do you integrate, you know, your, your skill set, or how do you build one when you can't communicate with someone? Um, and we see this in kitchens all over. The vast majority of cooks, dishwashers, prep cooks, servers, boys, the whole thing is largely Latin American. Um, and if not Latin American, from somewhere else in the world. Um, and a lot of people just get stuck in that job because of the language barrier. Chefs are so bogged down by everything that needs to happen that trying to, trying to explain something to someone that doesn't understand, that takes 10, 20 minutes, is, is like taking a huge chunk out of the day. So a lot of, a lot of people just sort of, it's like, here, you, this is what you do now. So two years later, you're still just peeling onions, right? Um, so part of our thing is, you know, how do, we, how do we teach vocational English to Spanish speakers? How do we teach vocational Spanish to, to managers? Uh -huh. we're, right, uh, we're opening near Gallaudet. How do we incorporate ASL for, for our guests and also staff? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're constantly trying to figure out ways to incorporate all of these aspects and use our platform. You know, you're talking about Rene and how big his platform is to be able to not just influence his, his cooks, but everyone else that's watching, right? So how, do we, are, how are we able to create a platform to be able to start affecting that change in our communities? That's beautifully said. And Hot Bread Kitchen, let's just put it a little plug for Hot Bread Kitchen in New York, which teaches ASL and gets a lot of immigrant women 
jobs? Um, um, before I start, I just wanted to say, um, on the previous question, I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I did work at Monaco for a little while when it was uh, the restaurant was post modern brasserie, and Chef Rob Wheeland, he was one of you mean this very place, this very place, right where we are sitting. Uh huh. I think I think I may have run some food out here a and, couple times. And you don't have PTSD. It's no, okay so Chef Rob, for you to come. Chef back. Rob Wheeland was one of. He is one of the most <laughs> even tempered. Um, fair, he's very, and, and just he was just an inspirational guy. Um, I mean, he, he's been, he has, he's had a garden outside um, doing hyper local stuff long before it was even a thing. Um, I only worked here a short while with him. I wish I had more time with him. He was, he was a, a really inspirational chef, um, kind of what, I, what I've always hoped to be um, in my kitchen, you know. Wow, thanks for telling us that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and in that small way, that's, you know, right now that's all I can do is try to have the kitchen where, have a kitchen where um, I take care of, of my staff. Um, right now in the restaurant industry, um, like Christian was alluding to, there are a lot of immigrants uh, in and out of status. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's just a really, it's a really, really scary plight with no with no end right now for um, for a lot of people. Um, I, I I overstayed my visa when I was finished with school, but in terms of, you know, I can always get back into status. I didn't come into the country out of status. Uh, a lot of these people, there is no, there is no exit um, plan, um, except giving up the, the only life that they have and they know right now. So, um, you know, I think any way we can bring, highlight that issue and I mean, that, that's what allows us to eat the way we eat and have all of these cool restaurants in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, just bringing light to that. And you know, I take care of everybody in my kitchen. And it's my family. And that's what you can do yeah. and the role you can play. Patrice? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I've done most of the hiring in my um, immediate career for both back in front of house. Um, so I've definitely seen what we're all talking about and <clears throat> for me I think the way I approach it is you know I mean I'm here to like I'm here to help if in any way I can so if um, and most of my kitchens have also been you know heavily Latino based too so I've I've seen the paperwork that comes through I've seen all that um, and when people don't have certain documents or you know, when I run into those situations, yeah, it's a, it's something that you have to deal with. And it's not a conversation where it's like, hey, sorry, we can't do this. You know, we, we work it out, we figure it out. And um, I think, um, I think if I, if I'm not sure if I'm gonna be making a huge difference, but if I can, um, I, that's something that I'm still learning how to do. And if, you know, I'm listening to you guys, I'm listening to other people, um, um, other chefs and other manage managers and restaurants and how they approach this. So it's a learning process for me and how to deal with it the best way I can and also um, do whatever I can in my power to make it better. Beautifully said, and that's what we do at Aspen in the Atlantic. We learn from each other <laughs> and we bring people together. Um, people here who are here in the audience, are there questions? Okay, we've got some hands up, and we're going to start with the woman in blue, because she had the very first hand up. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, and thanks for sharing your experiences with us. So when you started out talking, each one of you had a different experience, and each one of you had a different experience. Um, pointed up as the genesis for your restaurant, your concept, something um, with the ribbon of commonality that it had to do with your, oh no, <laughs> to do with your, um, your your background and in, in, in sort of this idea of the sentimental journey that, that we all are on. And in the audience, I'm looking around and every one of us is like, yes, and so we all get that. What I'm interested in, I've been in your restaurant and it's amazing, and um, I stood in line to do it, which <laughs> I'm old and I don't like standing in line, but I did. Um, Thank you. The, the reason that people go into a restaurant, I think sometimes is story and uniqueness and sometimes design and, and great reviews in, in, a, in a, a publication. But I'm really more interested in 
What gets people to come back and be willing to wait in the line and play this watching the website and hitting the button so they get that, you know, they get the three spots. Um, how do you, how do you put the importance on having the food consistently be excellent as opposed to the story and the people, which we've, we've heard how important that is. Thanks. Great, great question. Well, you well, who make people wait every night. <laughs> well, for me, for me, it, it's, um, you know, I can't remember it was all about the food. It, you know, I could, it was just whatever, whatever I was doing, it's about the food. Um, but I've learned that that is just, uh, that's just a small part. I mean, it's really important. But especially in a city like this now that has so many restaurants, you have to have a story. You have to have a reason for doing what you're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, the food has to be consistent. It has to be there. But the, the experience you create is what, is what uh, will keep people coming back. Any other response to that? Yeah, I mean, for us, for us, the story is basically what drives the food, um, what keeps our, I mean, through all of our pop-ups and all of our different events that we've done, what we've built regulars. We don't have our doors open yet, but we have people that come to every single thing. They stand in line, they're, they're there, and they make sure they get the food. Um, and it's just the fact that we have parallel lines of, of story, right? People, people have something that resonates or we have something that resonates with them, whether it be a dish, a salsa, the music we're playing, the decor that we have. We get people that come in um, that immediately go like, you know, I haven't been to Mexico City in two years and he just sort of took me back there. We also have people that come in that are here and because of their status have not been back home in decades and they eat the food and it's like they start tearing up, which is mind blowing. Um, but I think the, the, the story is basically what connects everyone, right? And people come searching for their own story when they come and eat the food. Yeah, service to me is super important. Um, they always have this competition with front and back of house. Um, and I think they're just equally important. And so when I spend my time in the front of house, I'm usually at the host stand um, or touching tables, um, getting to know guests. And especially in this um, situation with Goga Yogi, with such an interactive experience where you're having to like grill meats right in front of you. Um, my favorite thing to do is literally just flip everyone's meat. <laughs> so I'm just going around talking to people um, and I hope that translates into an experience that they will want to come back to. Um, so, yeah. And I bet they do. Um, <laughs> woman was second with a hand up and now you're the third, great. This is directed at Peter. H Street has a history of a lot of new innovative restaurants and chefs, and it's been that way for a long time. And I think it's primarily because there were lower rents. Now that that area is becoming more gentrified, is that threatened? Um, and are you helping ruin it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I hope I got in on the lower rent um, end and, um, <laughs> We actually took over a lease, but yeah, I foresee, um, you know, in the future, it's not going to be as accessible. Um, and that's, that is one of the problems uh, that's happening in the city. It's going to be harder for smaller uh, independent restaurants to open up. Sure. I'll just repeat your question. Don't need a mic. Okay. Um, actually, it's directed at Christian. You mentioned Quinta Kush way back at the beginning. I mean, <laughs> It's not exactly wild oh, mushrooms. Oh, no, no, we, start, we serve yes, it with yes, wild mushrooms. But what's the question here? The question is, how do, you balance, how do you balance being really, really authentic with people who might not want to try corn smut, right? Right. Well, we do, um, what, one of the restaurants that we, we admire and uh, look up to in the city is Two Amy's Pizza. Um, and they have a very dynamic food menu. Um, you can go in there and eat beautiful Italian salads. You can eat, you know, mussels. You can eat all, all kinds of things that you wouldn't necessarily understand, like basically find at another restaurant. But the grease that keeps the machine moving is the pizzas, right? 
So we have we have we have a staple menu that you know we we definitely have quesadillas, we have you know tostadas, we do tamales, we do all the things that really really bring the menu and that, that keeps the people coming. And then we have our little corner of like things that you know we find unique ingredients. Every time we go to Oaxaca, we come back with a pouch of chapulinas or grasshoppers. Um, and we put those on the menu. And they're definitely not for everybody. Not everybody comes in and says, hey, send me some bugs. Um, but the people that are looking for it, there's, there's that corner there. And are there people who are looking for bugs on menus? I'm not asking in a joke way, because three or four years ago, everything, everything, everything was insects. So that was the wave of the future, uh, live ants crawling out of your sour cream on top of your baked potato and caviar, which is something Renee would do. So. Um, what about you? Is, do you find people who really want them? We get a lot of questions. Yeah, we, we get a lot of people that, I don't know if anybody here has been to Oaxaca, but most people, when they get to Oaxaca, they never want to come back. Um, it's definitely a place of magic, um, and it's one of the few places in Mexico that still retains a high indigenous population, and a lot of that comes with all of the traditions and all of the um, dietary staples. Uh -huh. So chapulines are part of the agave ecosystem, and there is a lot of agave in Oaxaca. So chapulines are huge. Uh, chiniquiles, the, the red worm that people made famous by putting inside of a tequila bottle. It's definitely part of the diet. During rainy season, you get chicatana ants, which are the flying ants that come out of the ground. Um, it's huge over there. So a lot of people go down there and they discover this. And the flavor profile for all of these insects is completely unique. And people always ask me, what does it taste like? And I mean, it tastes like a grasshopper. I, I can't compare it to <laughs> anything. I can't say oh, it tastes like chicken or it tastes like a tomato. It, like it just, it tastes like what it tastes like. And you have to experience it like, by yourself to kind of discern what that is. And Patrice, do you face barriers with some of your sauces? Um, not so much the sauces, um, but I think in Korean food there are some, you know, intricate things like you know whether it's intestines or like you know beef belly or like. And do you put them on the menu? I have a few things on there, um, but we're, we're not pushing that envelope. We're trying to push that envelope to, too strong. Um, but, you know, maybe down the road when we want to feel a little risky and uh, put something exciting like that on, um, I think we I think it'd be fun. Because yeah. those are things that you're completely comfortable eating. Right. Well, no. <laughs> See, um, I, I like, no, not really, honestly. Um, I, I stay away from the bugs. Um, <laughs> um, and but I think at some point I do want to push myself to kind of explore those things. So the next time I go to Korea, I think those are that's probably one of the things I will tr ask my family to kind of take me down is kind of the more you know not uh, like non like unconventional things that um, that I haven't tried yet. So I think after hearing this, I'm a little inspired to kind of go down that route. <laughs> Well, I think so that we, we're out of time. <laughs> and um, I think that we're all going to want to go down the same paths and go straight to your restaurants. That's the first path that's going to lead us. So join me in thanking our adventurous, beautifully spoken, and thoughtful chefs. Oh, thank you.